So first and foremost, thank you for having me. I'm Victor Parrion Salas. Uh, I used to tell people that I like cooking. Um, and when people ask me if I'm a chef, that's, that's just one of the hats that I use. Um, traditionally, for lack of a better description, I cook, which is one of like the things that I like to tell people that I do for a living. Um, I, I got invited to do this and it truly, truly checked at a point in time where there was a lot of commotion happening. Um, a lot of things that fit the bill on this surreal topic. So thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you guys for joining so fast. I heard that it, it kind of like reached a massive amount of engagement very, very fast. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, now that they told me that this is a global thing, I'm a little bit more nervous. So <laughs> forgive me if some days you won't, or some parts of this you might not understand, but uh, I'll try to make it as painless as possible. Um, so surreal, surreal for me has a couple things. Um, the first portion of it is that I learned how to use Prezi in <laughs> an hour. That was very surreal. Um, I, I get by with a little help from friends, but um, traditionally one of my uh, new hires at the restaurant said, hey, by the way, there's this cool thing that new kids use in order to look a little bit more smarter, so you should use that. <laughs> so there it is. Um, surreal, what does it mean? There, there are two things. The first portion is a, main, a mix of facts and fantasy. Um, I think we can all kind of like think about this when we're a child. Um, we tend to have a, a very skewed connotation of what's reality and what is a fact. I keep a lot of it for the creative portion, no pun intended, on the food side where I have to look at it from a very, very surreal standpoint. So again, going back to what I do, I'm a cook. I need to relate to people within the first like 30 seconds. So if you sit down in my restaurant um, and you see this plate and it doesn't really resemble anything that you might have seen before, I think we've achieved a little bit of surreal portion of it and then hopefully what follows into it, it it's a pretty beautiful thing. Um, we're gonna apply this topic to myself, which is the person that I know the most, so that way I can relate to you fastest and then keep you guys engaged. Um, it has to do with fact and fantasy. So a little bit of facts. We established that I'm a cook. We have established uh, which country I belong to, which that's still up in the air. So there's a funny thing here in the US when you're trying to become a citizen, they ask you to refuse your country, get the other one, and you end up in the limbo. That's where I find myself today. So I no longer belong to Mexico, I no longer belong to the US. I'm just in the middle of it. Surreal kind of scenario, if you want to look at it that way. Um, fantasies of my life. So I am from Acapulco, Mexico, a very, very, very small portion of this state called Guerrero. And a fantasy of mine was to live outside of Acapulco for a long time. And I've been doing that for the majority of now 15 years to the date. And uh, that happened to be in a very specific kind of like trajectory. I, I was born into a little bit, let's see if it kind of works out. By the way, none of these photos are mine. And I apologize because the photographer is in the back over there, Heather Sargent. She kind of like was very kind to take some of this. Um, obviously, I was not born like this. I, I think that that would be a problem for any human being to be born that large. But uh, that represents Mexico fairly well. A um, little bit of commotion everywhere, a little bit of dirt everywhere, a um, little bit of beautiful things, and a lot of handcrafted things. All of it well represented in this photo. Um, Mexico was that for me. I lived in Acapulco, <clears throat> spent the majority of my childhood um, being told what to do. You know, I, I was supposed to be an athlete, which I will get into that in a little bit. Um, five foot nothing on the build. They didn't get too far on that, but <laughs> I, I tried really hard. 14 years of my life were spent doing that. Living outside of Mexico, this is what I, this is what I do on a general basis. 
Um, you can find me inside of the kitchen or outside of the kitchen, depending on who called off on which day. That's kind of like how it gets off. Um, but that's, that's essentially in a great photo what I like to do. Um, I spend most of my days working like all of you guys to kind of like give you something fun. Um, but that's where we go. <coughs> We're gonna, we're gonna set up a little bit of the background of this story. So as it says there, um, I was born into a middle class family. Now, um, I think that we can all relate to this a little bit further nowadays, but um, class, social class in Mexico has to do with a lot of the surrealism. So, and, and my art professor here from college is here too. I'm sitting down and I'm, <laughs> I'm struggling here, so uh, <laughs> forgive me if I, if I give this in the worst way possible, but this is how I understand it. So you're born into different classes, right? I was lucky enough to be born into the middle class, which stands for you're just a little bit less poor than the guy next to you. Um, I was born into two beautiful parents, um, one that at his time might have been one of the most prominent surgeons, and he unfortunately doesn't practice anymore, but he was quite a great guy in his field. Um, and a mother that I could not speak any more highly of. So my mother is a entrepreneur out of trade, which will move a little bit forward into that of, of why that is very important in this kind of topic in Mexico. Um, the two of them, you know, they met each other. They had me, which I'm the first one. And they kind of decided that it was going to be in the benefit of my life to understand how a person kind of grows up in this middle class scenario. Um, I was raised in a restaurant. My mother, that was her fifth business in her career. Um, one that was like the most long lasted, a long lived, if we want to call it that way, it lasted 25 years, which for me it meant that I practically spent most of my life from age zero until age 12, living in a restaurant. I thought a crowd like this in the morning, everybody had their end of the house. You know, I'd, I would walk up down the stairs and then in the morning there'll be people buying breakfast, grabbing it. We did three service, which is insane. I don't know how someone will, will do that. Necessity makes you do a lot of crazy things. But um, I remember waking up at 4.30 4 in the morning for practice and watching staff walking through the door and watching people walk through the door at five o'clock in the morning. I would come back from practice and this type of practice, I was a swimmer. Um, I represented Mexico for 14 years swimming, which is part of that push to be an athlete. Um, we'll get to that in a second. But the restaurant portion of it was what changed my perception of how people interact with others. So. Imagine that you are told from age zero until eight that your household is a stage and everything needs to be picture perfect. So I couldn't really have friends over because a friend over would take up a chair. That chair would mean that we didn't solve things, right? So I started becoming friends with the people that frequented the restaurant. And at that point in time, I grew at a fast more rapid pace than your average kid. By age nine, I was in charge of breakfast service in the restaurant um, for two reasons exactly. My sister, um, which if you have been following a little bit of the restaurant, um, she is deaf. Diana is the first Mexican child that was ever implanted with a cochlear implant. Um, and my mother, the only way that she could do this was to move from Acapulco to the capital during the weekends to get some rehab in between. So out of necessity, in the last portion of it, I had to join the workforce. I was eight years old when my parents split and divorced because of a lot of different things. You know, nowadays parents just divorce very easily. Back then it wasn't that evident. You know, we had a house, we had a business, we had two children, and I had to just learn how to really adjust very rapidly to all this. Um, by age 10, I had a very fast calculator and I sat on the cashier making sure that the money was coming in. That was my, that was my charging 
or taking charge of the business. So I put that towards my daughter. I have a seven-year-old daughter, and um, she, she's really cute, but she's nowhere near to be in charge of a restaurant at all. <laughs> so that kind of works out. Um, moving a little bit forward from there, I decided that the restaurant thing was, was really fun for me. And my athlete portion ended. I didn't make it to the Olympics, which is every little kid that trains from age seven all the way until 14. Um, I, I was good, but I wasn't as good as we wanted it. So um, at 14, I kind of like had to make a decision. What was I going to do? In Mexico, it's like a really weird. They force you to, to find yourself at 14. I'm still 30. I still haven't found myself. So I'm working on that thing. But um, culinary school became really evident. It was, it was a very, very fun portion for me. I chose to do two things. The first one was to learn a couple other languages. So obviously English is not my first language. I spoke French before speaking English, so my accent is really terrible. I apologize if you cannot understand me. But that's where we're going to get to culinary school. Um, I went to a couple different classes, and, and I met a guy that forever changed my life. Um, Eve, he was a retired chef from Lyon that partied extremely hard and then cooked extremely beautifully. So he came to the restaurant one day, sat down, ate my mother's food, came back again for a full month, eating every single night. Um, and he would be the only person that I could talk to in French. So I made it a purpose to really go over there and, and get my bearings with him, um, chew me apart in between because my French was really terrible. But um, he saw that I, I used to do a little bit of cooking. I used to do a little bit of everything. So he said, why don't you try this? Come work with us for one night. And then if you like it, we'll try to get you into culinary school. So I talked to my mother. I was like, this French guy says that I should probably do this. What do you think? And she said, go do it. You know, go, go check it out. Um, turned out to be an event for 500 people. There was four cooks, including Eve, that was halfway baked and drunk, um, which I learned in, I, I later learned that that was the majority of the culinary scene back then, you know. Um, I did the event with them. We partied really hard until the morning. And that was my first introduction to this world of culinary experiences. Um, back then, Acapulco was still the mecca for partying extremely hard. We went from 9 in the afternoon all the way until 1 a.m. in the morning, passing just incredible amount of food from 1 until 10 a.m. in the morning we were partying. I got all of that out of my system extremely early. By age 19, I was done, and I set out to do one thing that I like, really, really decided that it was going to change my life. I was going to live outside of Mexico for the rest of it. And with the help of Eve, I entered into the ETHQ in Montreal. So uh, I was the only immigrant that went to this school. Um, I was a first immigrant, so there was a lot of like, really different things for me. One, Montreal does not speak French. They speak Quebecois. So I got there, and what I thought I learned <laughs> had nothing to do with what they were talking about. So that was one surreal process for me. Second portion, the weather. I never expected Acapulco and Montreal to be that different. <laughs> Um, little that I know, I, I didn't pay attention in geography class, and I was pretty much screwed. Um, I went from wearing sandals to Carhartt boots as fast as you can potentially think of in October. So by like Dia de los Muertos, I was a joke of the school because it was still summer for them for all, pun, for all like, purposes. Um, needless to say, I, I got made fun of a lot in the school. And, and that fueled me, that fueled me a lot. You know, the, the idea that coming into a profession where I knew my particular background was only going to lead to the dish pit, because um, I was reminded of that every single day that I went to school, that I was only going to be in the dish pit, and only there that I was going to like, just make it, right? Um, if you ever had tried to go to college back then, we're talking about now 15 years, it gets quite expensive. Um, 
it, it really becomes a thing of challenging yourself. This amounts of money that were coming in front of me I, I've never seen. And then there was only one option. So I started working illegally in Montreal. And that kind of like led up to a lot of things. Two years of pure torture. Um, it was one of the things I walked to work every day, not knowing whether I was going to get like picked up and sent out or I was going to just be left alone. And thankfully, by then I had learned a couple tricks. I, I knew where to stand in the kitchen. I, I had a good mastery of my craft. Um, and I did not get kicked out of the country up until 2010. Um, that's when the laws of immigration really change. So as a student, I was able to work. And then that kind of like spearheaded a whole different scenario. After that, I met someone that changed forever my idea of what I would think of living would be. Um, that was the doctor Sir Roswell. Um, one day I got a call and they said, hey, you know, your mother has about three months pretty much if you don't get down here as fast as possible. So I came to Roswell, all this transition from a very prominent cook. Um, I got some great accolades back in Montreal and I get here and, and two years of that transition between arriving to Buffalo to checking new different kind of ideas um, were, were a dream for me. So from three months of potentially your mom will die to two years, this is gonna be the hardest thing you're gonna do. It kind of worked out, she's still around. So 10 years later, we're still here, which is awesome. <laughs> and that's, that's how surreal cancer was for me. Um, now, we talked about my mom being an entrepreneur. She's a great negotiator. Um, she's gone through this four times in her life. If you go through it once, that's kind of shitty. Go through it twice, that's really tough. Four times around, that really makes a difference, right? Like that really tells you that something is terribly wrong. So um, that made me realize that Buffalo was gonna have to be a whole different thing for us. So that's my mother on the other side. And again, none of these photos are mine. So thank you, Heather, for, for doing that. Um, through the process, my mother lost her husband to cancer. So we kind of like had to do a nice little cleanup. So we had two, two things, right? One is, what do you want to look at in the face of death? Do you stay the same or do you go full force and, and do that? And that's where I kind of like got an extreme love affair with Buffalo. I decided that Buffalo was going to be my home. I have been here now for 10 years and it's treated me really well. Uh, I've done five restaurants here and out of all of those, uh, Las Portas is what I think will be the most successful of it. So um, I had a little restaurant in Youngstown, which we do have some guests from Youngstown. Thank you guys for coming. Um, beautiful place, but it wasn't mine. You know, it was, it was a restaurant that had been there for 30 years before me. I walked right into it with my pennies and I walked right out of it three years later. That, that, was, the, that was the whole idea there. Um, I had to think on the, on the face of that that I needed to learn how to live like I had nothing to lose. And um, that's pretty accurate. I have about $300 in my bank account and then two credit cards and I get by really well with those two things. I've learned quite a few things. Um, that's a thought process that I had reoccurring, thinking that I was gonna do Las Puertas. And Las Puertas opened with the help of 32 pop-ups, um, which were extremely surreal. I would ask people to let me cook in their restaurant. They said, sure, why not? I posted on Facebook, which I learned to utilize very well. And then people will come like you did today. I would cook and then go on my way away. Um, Las Puertas, it's one of the most beautiful things that I've ever done. Fast forward a year into it, someone decides that we need to go to Tulum for a vacation. Um, we get there now. 15 years in my career, a little bit more of a bravado behind me, um, a lot of ego behind me. I said, I'm gonna do a restaurant in Mexico. And it is a, or it was a safety plan. I thought it was gonna be something that I could 
potentially relied upon if I ever get kicked out of the country. But we're going back to being in this limbo where you don't know where you, where you are, right? Um, I get to Mexico, fastest restaurant open in my life, four months in the building, two and a half weeks in the designing process. Don't ever do that. <laughs> if you, it, it really causes a lot of this rot in your life. Um, a lot of things were sacrificed in the middle. And then the restaurant opens. I run it for six months. And up until Christmas on the 25th, um, we decide that the restaurant needs to close down. So a um, couple things happen. We all are aware that Mexico has an incredible uh, relationship with the drug dealers. We all know that that kind of like just attracts a lot of attention. I walk in with press from the Washington Post, the New York Times, get there, don't live there. My team is there, but we get what is known as a drug deal put on our platform. And they say either you let us sell drugs or we let you have accidents. And I don't know about you, I don't like accidents in my restaurants. So decided to shut the doors on Christmas, spent the whole week with my team, kind of like having a good time. And then here we are. So a 1.2 million pesos might not be that much in American dollars, but it's still a lot invested. Um, a lot of sacrifice, eight months of my life kind of like gone through, the, through this, and it's gone and over. So between six months from today, um, I can say that very, very, very accurately, the topic surreal relates to my life in, in that process. Um, that's part of what, is, what it was and what is not today. The future. You know, I, I think at that point, this is where I just don't know. I, I don't know what holds for us. I have no clue what it will happen in the future. Um, but one thing I do, I do like to think is that if you set out to do something and you just stay on the course, it works. So losing the money, losing the restaurant, it's part of the business. I think that we can all intent on, on doing that. Thankfully, the one in Buffalo is doing great. So I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty happy with it. So I appreciate you guys coming over and listening to what I had to say in terms of what surreal means to me, because this past eight months have been very, very surreal in that kind of scenario. So thank you guys.